and welcome back to our top 10 countdown. My name is Teresa and today we have madness and mayhem on our agenda as we're counting down the top 10 mad queens in history that spoiled the throne. Let's get started. Number 10 in our countdown is Julia Get a Grip Agrippina. When the Emperor Claudius' wife, Melissiania, became entangled in an adultery scandal, the power position of the Roman Empress was suddenly wide open in the year 49. Julia Agrippina, exiled for a conspiracy against her first husband and widowed from her second that she was believed to have poisoned, concocted a scheme. In an outrageous maneuver, she seduced her own uncle Claudius to become his fourth wife. She didn't stop there, however. She then had her uncle husband make the son she had had in her prior marriage, Nero, his heir by marrying him to his own daughter from his previous marriage. Ooh, now that's that's quite a family tree. Taking the title Augusta, she maintained a stronghold over political and household affairs, considering herself a co-ruler to her husband. After Claudius died from eating poisoned food, which is how her prior husband died, so make the connection there, Nero became a Roman emperor and would forever change Roman history in his time of rule. However, Agrippina could only hover above her son for so long, and his annoyance of her invasiveness grew. Nero chose to assassinate his mother with a trap, a boat set forth on the Bay of Naples designed to sink. But when it did, she swam ashore. Nero changed his plans and had his soldiers invade her summer home to do the deed instead. Number 9 in our countdown may be one of our most badass queens, Empress Theodora, from street busker to top dog. Syrian born Theodora starts her journey as an actress, dancer, and mime alongside her two sisters in the late 400s, something she abandons by age 16 to be a mistress to a Syrian official. And she travels much of North Africa with him before his maltreatment and temper made her settle down in Egypt alone, where she took up wool spinning. It was here she met Emperor Justinian and the two fell in love. And after Justinian changed some laws so that they could marry, they began co-ruling the Byzantine Empire together. So what made her mad you may ask? Her ideals and the smearing that they led to through history. She was historically known for supporting religious freedoms, women's rights, and the education of the masses. Her decisions which reflected her opinions led to the Nicaea riots of Constantinople. She intervened and was able to persuade her husband to stay. The two successfully quelled the revolt and in turn, she made Constantinople one of the most sophisticated cities in the world and promoted women's equity. Theodora's name appears in almost all the legislation passed during the period and she received foreign envoys and correspondence with foreign rulers. Her husband died in 1527 AD and Theodora took sole control of the Roman Empire. Under her reign, bridges, aqueducts, and churches were built. Theodora died of cancer on June 28, 548 AD. She and Justinian are both considered saints by the Eastern Orthodox Church. The She-Wolf of France is in number 8 of our countdown. Her actual name is Queen Isabella of England, and she was famously married to the closeted Edward II. Acting as a beard to someone who doesn't love you would be hard enough, but the two did also have to produce heirs together. One would be the future King Edward III. Queen Isabella was in a desolate and lonely situation, especially as her husband's two male suitors, Piers Gaveston, who he gifted her jewels to, and Hugh Dispenser, who was a wildly hated extortionist, were always his preferred company. So she rounded up some spiteful nobles, first killing Gaveston by beheading and then driving Dispenser from the country and redistributing his wealth. King Edward unsurprisingly was upset and sieged against those who had contributed to the death and exile of his lovers, all whilst his wife took cover in the Tower of London. It's here she met exiled British traitor Lord Roger Mortimer and started her own affair. She had him broken out and sent to France where she later joined him and with her son and then sent Edward a letter that essentially said, suck it. The anger at having been cast aside turned into burning desire for vengeance as Isabella and invaded England with her new husband and army and usurped the throne, where she and Mortimer then ruled until her son came of age and had her dethroned for her violent tendencies. She died 28 years later in retirement and Edward III later went on to rule England for 50 remarkable years. Maria the Mad comes in at number 7 of our countdown. She was just 16 years old when she became the Princess of Brazil and the Duchess of Braxana, then their queen following the passing of her father. Brazil changed from just a Portuguese colony to a large kingdom. Brazil, the Algraves and the United Kingdom of Portugal are three famous formations recorded under Maria the Mad and her son. After the death of the queen's husband slash uncle in 17 1786, however, there was a noticeable decline in her mental health. 1788 saw the passing of her daughter, newborn son, and her closest confidant. By 1792, after the passing of her eldest son a year prior, Maria seemed to be experiencing a combined symptoms of hallucinations, depression, and anxiety, all resulting from mass traumatic losses. It evolved to later include religious mania and melancholia. She started avoiding court gatherings and social or royal obligations. It was then her treatment went to Dr. 
Francis Willis, who tried straightjacketing, blistering, and ice baths, none of which were helpful for obvious reasons. After treatment for more than five years, he declared the disease was incurable. By 1792, Maria was no longer a capable ruler and deemed insane. Courts pushed her son John to take over the government ruling, but he delayed until he finally took the throne in 1799 for a truly tragic reason. There was just no longer any possibility that his mother would ever recover her senses. If the nickname Maria the Mad wasn't already taken, then this next Maria named Monarch would have snatched it up. In at number 6 is Maria Eleonora of Bradenburg. Maria Eleonora was born in 1599 to Prince of Bradenburg and Anna, Duchess of Prussia. She grew up pampered, and Maria Eleonora was the it girl of the 17th century. All powerful monarchs fell over themselves to marry her. While she was dismissive of the 22 year old Swedish King Gustav Adolphus initially, in 1620 she changed her tune as she had apparently fallen in love with him practically overnight. And so they were married. With the king so frequently risking his life in battle, it became imperative that his wife produce a male heir. So Maria had to hanker down and focus on the baby making business. Maria experienced three stillborn children consecutively before the successful birth of her daughter in 1626. It was a rare break in battle, so her husband was there to excitedly greet his daughter. Maria, however, had a very different response. Her baby was born with the condition fleece lanugo, a condition where hair covers the body of a newborn. Her infant was enveloped from its head to its knees, leaving only its face, arms, and lower legs visible. Maria was horrified, claiming to have birthed a demon, and rejected her daughter for the decade to come, even after losing her husband in 1632 Battle of Luck. And while everyone mourns their own way, it's easy to say Maria really took it up a notch. She forced their daughter to sleep in blacked out rooms and reportedly hung King Gustav's heart in a golden casket on the ceiling above the bed, making the girl sleep directly under her father's blessed remains. In 1633, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden with her beloved's embalmed body. She refused to bury Gustav for more than a year, reportedly embracing and caressing the decomposing king. Maria's story continues to become more demented with time and her daughter grows to become her caretaker. Her, especially when troublesome Maria runs away to Denmark permanently and her daughter's left to become the queen and pay her mom's allowance to Danish royals. Awkward. Number five may have not gone mad, but it was her favorite emotion, Empress Anna of Russia. She is remembered as a horrible and spiteful child with a cruelty streak. Young Anna it was reported to be mannerless and vulgar. So when her father, who experienced a stroke shortly after her birth that left him handicapped, passed away, her very traditional mother attempted to raise her in classic elements of strict religious just femininity, so she may be a quiet and obedient woman. Anna had other plans. She hunted animals, kept guns and swords, and terrorized other children as well as the commoners. This behavior was all a massive red flag for some of the crazy things she'd do later in life when granted power and the means. Anna's only husband ever was Frederick Williams, who at their reception indulged a little too heavy on alcohol and gave him a hangover so wicked that three days later he just died. In 1730, her uncle Peter the Great passed. The Privy Council turned her into the empress of all of Russia since she was widowed and childless, which was assumed to cause less trouble. The joke's on them because she turned around and immediately abolished the Supreme Privy Council and re-established the autocracy. Now she had the sole power, and while she made some serious political waves, Anna also made some strange choices. She has a serious vendetta with Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was a better looking, younger, and also a rival for her throne, so she ruined her life. No nobleman could marry Elizabeth. If Elizabeth chose a commoner, the empress would strip her of her titles and her claim to the throne. When Anna found out about Elizabeth's side piece, the unhinged empress ordered her men to cut out his tongue and exiled him to Serbia. Anna even woke up one morning and decided to force Prince Mikhail to marry her lower class older maid as a joke. After the ceremony wrapped up, Anna placed the prince, Mikhail, and the maid in a cage, dressed them as clowns, and paraded them on top of an elephant to an ice palace she had constructed for their honeymoon. In the extreme cold of Russia, she reportedly advised them to get to doing the dirty with each other if they wanted to keep their bodies warm enough to stay alive. Maria Eleonora wasn't the only queen who couldn't give up on a dead relationship, pun intended. Number four is Joanna of Castile. Never meant to be a princess, let alone a queen, Joanna earned her title and nickname Joanna La Loca through unfortunate means. She had two older siblings, Isabella who passed in 1498 and Joan in 1497. Joanna's mother, the formidable Catholic monarch Isabella I of Castile, passed away in 1504. This left the throne to, of Castile and Lyon to Joanna when her father passed in 1517. Joanna had started exhibiting signs of mental instability in 1504 when her mother had been sick. She was struggling to eat or sleep and having outbursts of anger. One such example was when she wished to go see her husband in Flanders. The journey would take her through France, which Castile were at war with at the time. When she was prevented from leading for Flanders, 24-year-old Joanna flew into a rage. Perhaps
Perhaps one of Joanna's most notable displays of mental instability occurred when her husband died in 1506. Joanna refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time, reportedly opening the casket to kiss or embrace him. I'm seeing a pattern here with some of these women. While pregnant, Joanna traveled with her husband's body from Burgos to Granada, a distance of 668 kilometers, which would take around six and a half hours to drive in a car today. And talk about a romantic imbalance, while she did all of this posthumously, when her husband Philip was alive, he talk Joanna's madness to anyone that would listen and completely discredited the woman. In 1509, Joanna was placed in the royal monastery slash covenant of Santa Clara in Tostillas, Castile by her son Charles, who also forbade Joanna to have any visitors until her passing. The most recognizable name on our list is Marie Antoinette, who is number 3 in our countdown. Married at only 14, Marie was known to have lived an opulent lifestyle, but there was a lot of conspiracy and debate about the young woman. She was performing what she knew her royal duties to be, and she was known for not not always being the most educated. She started the trend of riding donkeys and the worldwide trend of feathered slash stuffed bird hats. She even once had an entire miniature village created with functioning shops so that she and other elites may dress like commoners and experience living lower status. Marie was misguided and young, but she was also the victim of an incredible smear campaign. She was accused of having ulterior motives constantly, supplying the Austrians with military plans or siphoning millions of livres of treasury money to Austria. It was the tales of sexual deviance that were the most damaging though. Alleged to have had orgies, laid with commoners, or even have sex with her own ladies in waiting. Her most offensive accusal was thrown at her in trial before her famous decapitation where she was accused of committing indiscretions with her own child Louise Charles. With such a vast array of accusations against her, not one of which was supported by any concrete evidence, the trial was a formality, conceived merely as a step towards completing the revolution. Marie Antoinette was declared guilty and executed only hours later at the age of 37. Speaking of sexual deviance, meet Queen Anna Nazinga, who is number two in our countdown, queen of what's now known as present day Angola. Anna took the crown when her brother passed away. Being queen of Angola was hard work. Anna managed to keep the Portuguese invaders out for over 40 years alone. So, how would you, a tough and titanous queen, decompress? Why, by building a harem, of course. Anna collected the men she found to be the most attractive warriors in her region, keeping a harem of 50 to 60 men close at hand for whenever she, well, wanted a romp in the sack. Spending a great deal of her time strategizing around battlefields in men's apparel, some historians wonder if that's why she required the men in her harem to dress as women. Now Anna didn't have time to deal with picking who she was going to sleep with every night, so she devised a unique system. Anna would just have the two men who desired her the most that evening fight to the death every night and then bed the winner. The next day, the winner still loses as she would have them executed. Anna disbanded her harem at 75 when she took on her teenage husband, cementing her status as not only a serious badass who liberated her people and established dominance in an era of men, but also as a cougar. The next queen fought her way to the top of the countdown. Number one is Queen Rananavola the first. During her reign of Madagascar, Queen Rananavola the first is remembered as a dangerous tyrant who ruled her island nation with cruelty and an iron fist. Rananavola was a merciless to those who tried to colonize her nation, but also to those inhabiting it. Should crimes, disputes, or discourse arise, Rananavola had a nifty trick to solve it called trial by ordeal. Both parties would be forced to ingest three pieces of chicken skin alongside a poison taken from a native plant, Tangana. Throw up your chicken skins and you're proclaimed innocent, hooray! If you didn't, you were guilty and be put to death, if the poison didn't kill you first. This trial was one of the punishments used in her persecution of Christian colonists, alongside throwing people into rock quarries and live dismemberments. Her horrific list really will go on. Rana Lavona was such a deadly tyrant that the queen managed to reduce her country's population from 5 million people in 1833 to 2.5 million in 1839. All through means of war, executions, religious persecution, or just settling scores. Depicted as a deranged tyrant even after her death in 1861, many have tried to repaint her image as one of a driven ruler trying to keep her culture and country independent from those trying to grow their own selfish empires. What's your take? Thank you so much for tuning in, that's all we have for now, but we'll be back soon with more of the top 10 countdowns. Until then, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe, and remember to comment down below which queen you truly think was the most mad.